Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Miranda Mason, and don't touch your dials, your YouTubes, your Insta snaps, or how, however you listen to us. This is No Putts Given, episode 28, and I promise I am supposed to be here, so let's get it. No Putts Given is powered by My Golf Spy, the most extensive reviews in golf. Before you buy, My Golf Spy. Nine million readers do it every year. Check us out. So we've been off for a nice winter break here, so we'll reintroduce you to everyone. Of course, we've got Tester Extraordinaire, who basically lives in the testing facility, Harry Nodwell, over here on my left. Tony Covey is joining us via Skype. He's my Golf Spies editor. And, of course, we have owner and founder Adam Beach here. Now, Adam, the number one burning question right now, who the heck am I and why am I here? This is the new host of No Putts Given and the better host of No Putts Given. We got an upgrade. Could be worse. (laughs) Miranda Mason is our new host of No Putts Given. She is formerly from the Patriots. I worked with the Pats for two years. Yep. Yep. Well, nobody's perfect. I know. It was was rough. It wasn't rough, but it was rough. Bob is really jealous right now. (laughs) Uh, Miranda is, like I said, our new host of No Putts Given, and um, she's going to bring a different side of things that I think is very much needed to this show. And that is just... uh, Professionalism? (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Well, sometimes. I can't promise all the time, but I'll do my best. (laughs) So, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And I'm joining on a special episode because it's release season. And from what I'm reading, there have been a bunch of new products released to the market in the last couple of days, really since the beginning of the month. And we're Too many. Too many? Too many. It says the director of testing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we've got a bunch. And so if we just jump right into it, Callaway's put something out, TaylorMade, PXG, Mizuno. Callaway, we'll start with them. They've got the new Maverick driver out. And what I was reading is you, you've said this is compelling. Why? Yeah, it's, I mean, every year, right, golf companies have to do something different. And we're seeing different stories from Cobra and TaylorMade. And and Callaway's story is like, we can get more ball speed on off-center hits with the face. We don't need MOI. We don't need forgiveness in the conventional sense. And so we're going we're gonna to create this new super aerodynamic shape that's going to give you more head speed. And you're not going to sacrifice anything else. You're going to get more consistent spin. And it's, it's, as with every driver story, right? This is this is the latest, the greatest, and the best thing on the market right now. So, first of all, why is the name spelled so weird, Tony? Uh, trademark issues. I mean, it's always like that, right? <laughs> Everybody looks at it and goes, "That name is stupid," and you're like, "Well, yeah, it's it's not ideal." But somebody else in the golf space probably had Maverick, or in the sporting goods space, or. Oh, I thought I thought they stole it off Top Gun. I know it's spelled differently, yeah. but I thought that's where the idea came from. Well, it's, yeah. it's about unconventional thinking is the idea, kind of like mm-hmm. similar to Rogue, right? You have Maverick. It's it's meant to convey that it's it's unconventional and, and the spelling is unconventional. So that that kind of works. But it's uh, it's just a trademark thing. Like at the end of the day, it's tough, right? So like 2019 for Callaway was a great, a great year, right? So they were number one selling driver at retail, uh, most used driver on worldwide tours. They won the 2019 Most Wanted Driver Test. So can you are. can you improve on that? If they have such a great year, how do you make it better? Well, one way they can improve on it is by not failing as many steroid tests oh. um, or CT <laughs> tests on tour. So mm-hmm. it was a good year, bad year, right? So they, they did all these great things. They had a couple blemishes. But like you said, right, how do you improve on that? I don't think that was Callaway's fault. I was going to say, oh. was it because they did something wrong or did something just arise as the club was being used more? I think it was a case of a lot of different factors, right? Look, at the end of the day, golf is terrible at standardizing anything, whether it be shaft flex or compression on balls. Um, you can't completely blame Taylor or Callaway, I would say. But at the end of the day, um, this year, what helped – part of the reason they failed these tests was for the AI face. Would you not agree, Tony? Uh, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily the face. It was just sort of like as everybody's doing, and especially on tour, you want these guys to – to eke out every you know tenth of yard they possibly can and so you're you're trying to push the limits and you get to the point where you you kind of push past the uh the the tolerance range of the gauge right you can't live inside that tail that that tolerance range and and i think callaway in particular probably flew just a little bit close to the sun we've saw that in testing off-centered hits are a little bit 
unforgiven um to say the least so this last year, year you mean last yeah. year yeah so last year so yeah 2020 uh so last year it were unforgiven but this year they've what apparently fixed that is that correct so the story right last year they they told the computers to go out and design a new face for us and and their, their target was hey find a way to get us a design that gives us more speed still within the limits but not don't worry too much about the off-center stuff, right? It was kind of a focus here at the expense of kind of out here on the rest of right. the face. And so so this year they told the computer, hey, yeah, we, we got we to gotta kind of prioritize off-center ball speed more than we did. So that to me is one of the big things to keep an eye on during testing is, is looking, you know, the number we use, not particularly exciting, not something every golfer looks at, but the standard deviation of that ball speed number as your impact moves around the face. How consistent are you getting that? The two areas that Callaway really can improve the most are – basically off center ball speed right compared to last year and the sound sucked shit last year i mean yeah. at the end of the day the sound was awful um golf digest you know gave them five stars for sound but knowing full well that that was not an originally a five star award for that from what we've heard so the sound sucked everybody knows why it. does that matter though if if, it, if you're hitting the ball well who cares what it sounds like yes that's the right answer. But. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I feel like it's a legitimate question. It, it, like, I don't really care as long as my car goes fast. If it goes, I don't care if it yeah, sounds so like junk. Yeah, so sound and feel are correlated, right? So if somebody hears something, they, they also go, well, this feels good or feels bad based on how they hear it. And they've done studies where if they just put earmuffs on someone, basically how they hear things changes, which changes how they now say the driver or club feels, right? So golfers, it's kind of like clothing. Um, or style. Style evolves and changes. You don't really know how or why, but golfers like a certain sound. And this is my guess. Golfers have started to like the hollow tinny sound less. And I think it's probably because a hollow driver probably means no tech inside of there, in their head. Man, they're going, if it's hollow, there's nothing It's not in cool there. enough. They're, not, they're not working enough. hard enough to, exactly. to do what they want it to do. So I think they like a more <laughs> muted sound, a more, you know, whatever the word they use is now. But it's a moving target for sound and feel, but it's real and golfers won't play a driver if it sounds like shit. You learn something new every day. Sound is trendy. There's a range, right? There's a range where you're like, you can, you, if it's kind of over here, you're all right. And if it's over here, it's okay. But I think, I think the Sub-Zero model in particular with the, uh, the Epic Flash was sort of outside that, that comfort zone for a lot of us. And it was, you know, it, like you said, performance should be the only thing that matters, but there are a lot of clubs that perform. And so, you know. It would be like me seeing Tony with some really tight jeans on and me going, eh, that's, just, <laughs> that's, that's too much. It's a subjective thing, you know, and we care about trying to be objective and da datacratic as we say. But at the end of the day, man, we can give you all the data in the world. But if that driver doesn't, you know, sound like you Well, that's to, why we gonna... take subjective feedback um, on every test that we do because – they might say that this looks like crap and feels terrible, but it's the best. It's well, best we don't care, but we have to relay that message. We have to because that's what people consumers. want. Yeah, and it, it's always it's always interesting too to see what correlations exist between yeah. you know how I how I perceive this driver. Do I like the way it sounds? Do I like the way it feels? And and what we get out of the other end on the launch monitor. And it's always interesting to me that you know people will tell you when you when you ask golfers to say I can't play a club that I don't like the way it looks or I, I don't like the way it feels I could never I could never be successful on a golf course with this and then you kind of look at the numbers and go eh, actually it was one of the best even though you hated it it was one of the best you hit does it usually correlate is there any trend in that is that something you can really study it is we've studied it for years in a couple different categories putters specifically oh, because yeah, putters for sure. The reason we started there is because a guy would always say, or a girl would say, I can't look down at a putter, not like it, and putt with it. And we go, okay. Huh. So we started doing testing on the two, and there's not only no correlation, oftentimes it's direct opposite. The ones that An they, inverse, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you wonder if you wonder if guys are looking at this putter and go, Oh my god, I, I hate how this looks. I can't stand the look of it. I'm I'm just really gonna focus on the ball. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But subconsciously, you're already you're thinking like I, I've had that personal experience where I'm looking down at something and subconsciously I know what it feels like and sounds like in the first. Like it still it still messes with my mind some from time to time. That's what people say, right? But the data doesn't support it. Exactly. But I don't know. It's it's just one of those ones. Personal opinion. You're in the facility. Is the Maverick sounding better? You hear it all the time. It does sound better than last year. I mean. Uh, what have they got a ribbon there that's that's making it um sound a little bit different 
So they, they were allowed some internal structuring, structuring helps sound like how you basically facilitate that reverberation right. inside of a driver. And based on the way they changed the shape of the head allowed them to do some more internal ribbing, correct? Well, yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't necessarily how they shape things, but the, uh, hey buddy, the, uh, <laughs> the computer gave them some ideas of, of where to put ribs. And they, they talk about in one case in particular, like the computer said, Hey, put, put a rib out here on the toe. And it, it's not a place that the Callaway says they would have thought to put a rib. And so again, yeah, it's all wherever they can find improvements without allocating too much mass to structure. And it definitely, it, you can definitely tell a difference between last year's model and this year's model um in testing um and people like the sound the testers like the sound so you're the guy that has seen more shots between the 2019 and 2020 too version many than, shots than anybody on youtube or anywhere probably okay? in, in the world probably in the world that's not an understatement right there it's no, not an embellishment not. yeah do you think it's better than last year's driver so far so far yes which is scary because i won last year so it's interesting right so you see all these youtubers hurry up and throw a review up really mm -hmm. fast which can be misleading to hundreds of thousands of consumers right which is why we go to the extent of the testing protocols we have because it can be misleading to throw out something and say well here's a new driver i want to hurry up and get it out the day that it's released right get a couple hundred thousand views and get my opinion out there but the reality is people are basing that opinion on literally five to ten shot skin and i know we've punched this punching bag a million times mm -hmm. but people just still aren't grasping the fact that that means nothing. Like one tester, no outlier detection system, uh, <laughs> basically taking only the best shots, which the average golfer, you need to see how a driver performs on the entire face. That's where the rubber meets the road, yeah. right? Um, it's just zero value. So, you know, you're really the expert in this situation so far right now in, in regards to seeing the most shots between the two models. And everybody so far, from what I've heard from you, says it's a better driver. Yeah. Um, and Obviously, we're, we've still got half the testers going to hit that driver because um, there's nine sessions this year. With, I think we're up to 39 drivers, which is unbelievable amount. I think we're up by 10 last year. Um, You're a little tired today. I am very tired. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it's great because I get to see every club being tested. And there's a couple of surprises out there, um, which which is impressive. I'm surprised about some of the feedbacks coming out and... You wouldn't think it from some of these manufacturers either. It's interesting too, right? Like, again, I, I, I don't know what the expectation is with the average golfer. If like you expect, <laughs> hey, a driver, this new driver, it, it's not going to be 10 yards longer. It's, it's not going to be five yards longer. Even if it's two yards longer, you, you probably actually achieve something. Well, I think the sooner golfers, every golfer that listens to this, every golfer that ever hears this from somebody can grasp this, 10 yards more is no longer a possibility. It's over. Except for that fairway wood. Well, that's a category that the tech hasn't really Yeah, but Tony, when far. you top off the tee, you're gaining like 100 yards for your next shot. <laughs> so, <laughs> 10, oh, more yeah. 10 more yards than a top, your yeah. last top is easy to achieve. But the 10 people, golfers just need to get out of their head that these, these claims that the manufacturers have built into their brains are no longer possible. It's evolutionary, not revolutionary, right? So like, they're, if they can squeak out a mile per hour ball speed, that's that's a that's huge, Massive. huge in 2020. And what I I posted again on Twitter again. It's one of these things that I've I've said often. But if you look at you, you talk to to guys about actual sales data and replacement cycles, the average golfer replaces his driver roughly once every four years. So, you know, Callaway's Maverick, Taylor Made Sim, whatever. It's it's not for the guy who bought a driver last year. That's 100%. I mean, yeah, don't absolutely they would love it if everybody bought a new driver like uh, every year. But the reality is they understand. It's not for the guy who bought one last year. It's for the guy who bought one four years ago, or in some cases, five, six, seven, eight. So, you know, if, if you just bought a driver within the last six months to a year, you shouldn't yeah. expect much. If you if it's been four years, you're probably going to see something a little bit better, something more quantifiable. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so these golfers that say, hey, can you test last year's versus this year's? We're, I'm just going to tell you, generally what we've seen over almost 10 years of doing this is about a yard creep every year, right? And... That's what is to be expected. So the the recommendation to consumers is don't buy a driver every year, maybe every three, and almost definitely every five, right? And you can expect gains. I like that. I like yeah. that. General rule of thumb. All right, moving on. Moving on. Well, before we do, you can fix the yeah, fact Tony, that the Callaway the is orange. Yeah, hang on a minute. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just That's <laughs> yeah. so bad. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we, we did have one last point, though. For those that hate orange, you can fix it, right? That is correct. Callaway Customs, formerly you design. You can go in there and you'd have to look at the article. I can't remember exactly how many different points of customization you can, can choose. But the bottom line here is if, if you don't like the orange, you can totally remove it from your driver. Well, make- cool. his uh, Callaway and Sean, if you're listening, can you put <laughs> some weird. emojis on that on that um, <laughs> that driver too? Like, I want you a want peach, the peach emoji and a <laughs> squirt emoji for Tony. <laughs> Tony just needs the Puma emoji on a Callaway driver. Pineapple, Pineapple and the big cat, yo. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we can move on. TaylorMade also released a driver, the SIM. So SIM stands for shape in motion. And Tony, I don't mean to call you out, but before testing started, you said TaylorMade would be the number one driver this year. You still feel that way? Uh, I Well, to clarify, yeah. I said, mm. the, said the number one driver at retail. So the best selling okay. driver. And, and hell yes, having kind of seen everything and... And, you know, I, I learned a lot photographing these things for, for the website and my stories and the pictures. And you, you kind of start to get a feel for, for what has visually interesting features, the kind of thing that's going to have a guy walk past it on a rack and pull it off and, and want to hit it. And, yeah, I mean, I think just in terms of the cosmetics alone, TaylorMade absolutely positively nailed it. I think the crown design in particular is is probably the coolest I've seen in in years and yeah I, I i hate myself for admitting that but yeah it's it's absolutely beautiful the the soul it's interesting in the same way that that the cobra speed zone speedback evolution is interesting because there are similarities there but yeah i think i think absolutely sim will be the number one selling driver on the market in 2020 you mentioned the the look of the club i was actually in the facility the day that harry got it in the mail and was starting um to do the testing you said you imagined it being the star star trek enterprise that it, it was you star could trek see it so we've floating had, through space we've had star wars that with the new tireless model and i saw and i saw the future ex- yeah i was just seeing it go through I can space see it. <laughs> i can see it i didn't know if i liked the look of it but just like the maverick it was the more I look at it, the more it, it feels comfortable and looks more comfortable. But I, I don't know if I'll be able to hit that driver off the deck because that big soul plate is going to play a little bit. How many bit times do you hit driver off the deck in a year? In England, a lot. We're not in England. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I am an idiot on the golf course. and Hey, me too. That'll be fun. Yeah. So part of the story with me being an idiot is I, I hit driver off the deck frequently and i've actually Boom. gotten pretty good about it i i have people who will, will go on record and say that yes uh tony may hit a driver off the deck better than he does off the tee and i can't say for sure with the sim because i haven't off, haven't hit it off the deck but something again uh speed zone for example i have hit that off the deck and it's got that similar kind of that that structure that big mass chunk at the bottom and i I've you had mean no issues you mean the inertia all, so. generator the inertia <laughs> generator yes but here's what I see is like that big soul plate, obviously with a driver off the deck, you're going to have to hit down the ball because if you try and hit up that end of the bottom of that club, that soul well, plate, it's, it's going to ha- be It's hard to have an up first. angle of attack. I mean, look at that though. I mean, you're a long way away. And again, it's still smooth, right? It kind of hangs off the back, but apart from the channel. Yeah, but how many people do you know have an up angle of attack hitting it off <laughs> the turf? I know probably about three testers that would do that because they got like... <laughs> we call that hitting the big ball before the small ball. You hit the earth and then the ball. I mean, I guess I guess in general, I wouldn't recommend choosing a driver based on your ability to hit it <laughs> off the deck anyway. Good point, good point. It'd be, uh, I don't know that we've ever covered that in any fitting scenario I've ever been in where they're like, all right, now uh, take it off the tee and whack it. Here's what I love. I love the name Inertia Generator because they brought us Twist Face. They brought us Speed Injected. They brought us loft up, and now we've got inertia generator. And you can joke TaylorMade all you want, man, but they break it down to the most simple, effective marketing terms like sim, shape and motion, you know? And twist face was the number one double word thrown Pringle. around in golf Pringle, last Pringle year. face. Yeah. And That's right. um, they come up with the best ones. They're generally two uh, words. And Injecto they, face is they what I translate in your head. To. <laughs> this Injecto one, face. I don't know if this is as good, but... It gets the point across. It's, it's like generating inertia. All right. Yeah. I, like it. I mean, 
I love the simplicity of this story too, right? Because again, like you mentioned, we're we're used to things from Taylor made like speed injected twist face and Y tracks, T tracks. We talked about it in the article, right? All these all these little elaborate things that they do to to sort of suggest performance. And here, and it, it really is the evolution of M6 into the whole line. But they're saying, yeah, we've we've kind of just changed the shape of this so we can put weight where it can be really efficient from a performance standpoint and not cost you an aerodynamic penalty. So you get forgiveness, you get ideal launch conditions or better launch conditions, and presumably maybe a little bit more head speed from aerodynamics. So that one is always dicey. And as I always have to say, disproportionately benefits higher swing speed players. So if you swing below 90 miles an hour... Pre- Sounds like one of those disclaimers for Viagra. It, it really is. It does. I mean, <laughs> look, you know, your mileage may vary. And- Says it really fast. <laughs> words that no one understands. If, if you don't swing fast or reasonably fast, the aerodynamic properties effectively don't matter. That's that's just how Basically, it is. you're saying if you don't swing fast, just quit golf, right? Well, I didn't say that. I think I think this year, from just looking, observing, testing, is the slower swing speed guys, there's too much he- weight in the head for them to control where it's going. Um, the faster swing speed guys love it. The sim? The sim. And that's part of kind of the design creep over the years, right? Heads have, heads have gotten a little heavier. You kind of had to adapt to that, uh, and that's and that's why you've seen things like the Zexios and these lightweight stuff as as kind of the mainstream market has moved to a place where it maybe is just a little too much for the average guy. Well, there are three models that are being launched, right? Sim, Sim Max, and Sim Max D. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so what are the main differences? Like, who buys each of the models? So the Sim is the flagship, right? So that's the only one with a movable weight. So that's going to be the one that most people are toying around with and buying. Yeah, players, players kind of profile. Yep, you've got a Sim Max. And that's the one they actually think is going to be their biggest seller. So that is kind of the, you know, Max usually says, hey, this is maximum forgiveness. But but TaylorMade said, hey, this is this is our middle of the bell curve model. Is that Ohio MOI too? The biggest MOI? Yeah. So... What um, is there a difference between MOI and forgiveness? Because I know those two kind of get interpreted differently and think it's the same, but it's not. Interpreted. 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 <laughs> MOI is a contributing factor for forgiveness. So MOI is, I guess, the best way to describe it is a preserver of ball speed. So right when you when you miss the center of the face, the club kind of wants to kind of go like this, right? And deflect a little bit. So the higher the MOI, typically kind of the less the club wants to bang open or bang closed. And so because of that, you retain more ball speed. But there's also an element of of what happens when you hit it high and low on the face. Does it does it produce consistent spin? So that's part of the Maverick story, right? That spin robustness. And then the other piece of it is is that bulge and roll radii, which is, you know, the curvature of the face, top, you know, top to bottom and, and heel to toe. How effective is that bulge and roll at keeping the ball in place? So those are those are kind of the, the components of forgiveness, and MOI is really the easiest one of those to quantify. All right, so the three models, just so everybody understands that's listening, you got the SIM, the SIM Max, and SIM Max D. One is the flagship, the SIM with the move weight. The Max is the highest MOI, and the Max D, if you guys have a banana slice out there, you're going to be looking at the Max D, which is what we call a slice killer, you know? All right, release is February 27th. Yes, yep, Adam? 549, February 27th. Okay, so moving on, PXG uh, released the Gen 3 irons. Now, from what I've heard, the biggest complaint about PXG is the cost bracket. Yeah, get over it is what I would say, I <laughs> okay. guess. Um, <laughs> it's like anything, cars, milk, you know, between Whole Foods and Food Lion, whatever brand, you know, like... There are lower cost models and there are higher cost models. And it's all relative based on, you know, $5 to you means something different to me, right? And I just don't understand why people have so much hate towards any brand, no matter what the cost is. Like most 95 probably percent of the people that hate PXG have never even seen one of these products in person, much less tried them. So like before you hate any brand, I think you should just have the opportunity to you know or at least give yourself opportunity to try it before you make some asinine comment you know because pxg is doing things that is going to benefit other golfers via other brands meaning 
they have done things that pushed an envelope because of what they are able to spend from an R&D standpoint, which they then have to put into the cost of their product, which is trickling down to other products from a technological standpoint that is paying dividends in the future for all consumers. So look at them as just an envelope pusher. And if you can't afford it, be thankful that somebody's out there pushing, you know, because the other people, Tony knows this, the other people would love, the R&D people that work at these other companies would love to be able to spend the amount of money that PXG does on developing product and tech the way they do. But they can't because they don't have the money to do it because then they would have to sell their product for such an you know, incredible amount of money. No consumer would buy the Mizuno driver, you know? So you're not necessarily saying they're the Maserati of golf in terms of Maseratis are expensive because they're fine-tuned, they go fast, I would say they, they look are. great. Okay. Because Maserati, it, Maserati is also about an experience. If I buy a $549 SIM, I get that damn thing in a, in a, ball, in a brown box. box. There's no experience to that. I go buy a PXG. By the way, if I want to buy a PXG set of irons, they'll drive their van to my local course and... Give me a fitting with no obligation. like, And basically white glove service that thing with a fitting for me. I don't know of another brand in golf that's doing anything close to that. I mean, look, we, we get to unbox pretty much everything at the studio. And those PXG comes in and I was like... It comes in like a media kit. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah it's, it's like opening a Mac computer. It's just a detail. Details matter, man. Put it this way. How hard is it to throw a PXG box away compared to a TaylorMade oh, box? Uh, they ain't going anywhere. There you go. Yeah. People sell those things on eBay for like a hundred dollars. The box, yeah, I, just for the box. I refuse to believe that. Like I know we've seen it, and I, st- I like, I'm like, who's buying a box? But <laughs> you know, and I understand if you don't have the money, that kind of makes you pissed off, right? You go, man, those guys. I can't afford that shit. And then you go, okay, you can't afford it. I'm sorry, I can't afford a Maserati either. But that doesn't mean I hate on Maserati, right? Like, and that's the thing. I'm not. I'm not going on uh, like car enthusiast websites and bitching about the cost of a Maserati, right? It's just I. I don't. I don't understand that mindset. Like if you if you don't like it, can't afford it, hate it for whatever reason, all right, don't don't buy it. Well, to this day, I don't think you or I ever commented on a single blog before we started my gospel. Did you? That's true. Like it just it wasn't in my nature to begin with, for sure. Yeah. Well, are so. they mad that it's expensive and they can't afford it because it's good and they want it? Like, do the products live? I mean, Harry, you haven't started iron testing yet, but you've said you've hit these. Do they live up to the way that they're packaged? Is that why um, people are angry about it? Compared to last year, yes. Um, I was a little bit disappointed in last year's one. The feel was a little bit clicky to me, a little bit boxy. This year, they come to play. Um, I've I've hit the tour version, the XP and the P the P version. Yeah, uh, all three versions, and there isn't much difference uh, in feel um, compared to all three. But obviously, one's more forgiven than the other, and then the other the ones tour version players. And well, that's that dual core and impact reactor. So they've kind of ev- you know evolved that face tech that they had from Gen One. What Gen is one an felt. impact reactor oh, in a man. golf club. Tell them what the impact reactor is, Tony. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it sounds like like when I was um, growing up and watching Nickelodeon, and they had like the Nerf gun commercials. <laughs> impact reactor, dual core. Like that's what it sounds well, like. It's it sits right next to the inertia generator. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean it's just it's it's a fresh take on you know we we used to call it the goo right the original stuff they put in their club and now it's it's it. it borrows you know in in the golf world we talk about dual core usually in the golf in with golf balls and it's a similar concept right you're you're taking two different materials and layer the, layering them to get the benefits of both so you have the softer inner material uh, within this dual core design that that provides the the feel right softer feel and then the the firmer outer material is what gets you ball speed and that's where they're saying the the new distance the the little bit of extra distance is coming although you know they're they're saying upwards of eight yards. Uh, you know, Mike Nicolette, one of their, their designers, says he got seven. I got just about three plus, and that is you know I mean that's not sound like much, but you're talking an iron that that was three plus longer, yards longer while still ma- maintaining the the launch conditions and and descent conditions you want using the same shaft. That's so my question. Actual real improvement. Uh, and again, three yards, I'd be happy with that. I think most golfers would be happy with that. Maybe you'll get more, maybe you'll get less, but again, it's really hard to do better now. So it's, it's every little bit and setting expectations appropriately. Yeah. I think the one thing that they lack right now, you know, from an optic standpoint is they just don't, they've got the money, they've got the tech, you know, they've got the bravado, they've got, 
you know, kaboom, baby. They got Bob Parsons uh, doing his own commercials, but they don't have enough tour wins optically right now, perceptually for the guy out there or girl out there to go, man, they're backing up what they're putting well, out. How many, how, many tour, how many tour guys have they got on? They've got a lot of staff. No, it's really, I mean, it's, it's only when you talk about like PGA tour, there's always, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's, Hey, we, we added a guy, but we lost two others and we added two and lost. Yeah. Another, but for a company that has that market share, they've got a lot on staff. Oh, I mean, for, for a company that essentially was didn't exist five years ago, they have a massive tour staff. But yeah. in the grand scheme of things, look, I don't. everybody wants to correlate equipment to tour performance, right? So you can say, well, well, look at Zach Johnson, right? He's, he's the textbook example that guys use. Like, he, he won the Masters. A couple of years later, he switched to PXG, and then he dropped off, right? So you're like, well, yeah, that, that is a true statement, right? And so you don't... But you don't know what else was going on in, in Zach Johnson's world. I could also tell you, hey, you know, a handful of years ago, Jordan Spieth was the absolute best player in the world. He kept playing Titleist, right? He hasn't, he hasn't switched brands, and he's fallen off. And, and You know what he did change? He changed it to a different Under Armour shoe. That might have screwed his whole game Well, that, game that's up. the point, right? Like, you, you can't draw these correlations. I've, I've talked to PXG about it, and... You know, they're like, yeah, it, it's at some level, right? It, it's it's more about the player than it is about the equipment. I, and I think that the tour is probably that that level. I think, you know, if you put Brooks Kepka, for example, who in, who in my opinion would be like the, the ultimate sort of PXG guy, like he fits that model. If you put Brooks Kepka in a PXG club, he's not going to drop off. He's not going to, you know, go from number one in the world to number 30 because he switched clubs. That's not going to happen. Dustin Johnson, for example, if you put him in PXG, He's still gonna be Dustin Johnson. It's just the reality, right? And so he's gonna think it's tailor made, though. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> That's what I mean. Like at, at some point, you have to be realistic because everybody wants to ask the question, "Well, who's using it?" And and the response is, "Who cares?" Because that guy is just really freaking good, and he's gonna succeed or or fail with anything. I know we don't care, but you got to understand that that is the two pushbacks that you get mostly are the money, and then also you know they haven't won that much on tour. Right. Well, what are you going to do? So when exactly is it going to be released? Do we know? Do we have a release date? It's on, It's now. You can go oh, buy these out. right now. It is out. Yeah, that's a PXG. They do that quite often is uh, embargo date is release date. So you can read about it, presumably get either really excited or really pissed. But if you're the former, then you can go actually try it and presume. But most, most of you will just go and look at it online and just, or just stare at the <laughs> box. Just stare at the box. <laughs> it's yeah. expensive and has screws. I love when people are like, man, it looks like a Mizuno Tezoid. And I'm like, I know that every time we drop a new product that somebody's going to say this looks like that. But, but it's a completely different club. I mean, come on, man. Mizuno Tezoid had zero tech, like zero tech, negative tech almost, which was a good iron back in the day. It was a good buy and buy. Though. But come on, man. Yeah, and I'm always like, I, I know you just want to get pissed off and rant and rave and react to a picture. But like literally go read the freaking article because I explained you know people don't it, read it's anymore. in there like that detail is covered so <laughs> <laughs> mizuno though did drop some putters they've got something new out the mcraft putters and i think what a lot of people don't realize is that mizuno's always been in the putter business right tony yeah they well not here not in the u.s but right. yeah they uh they've they've kept producing putters for the japanese market the asian market and the european market so it's it's really kind of a uniquely american mizuno problem that we haven't had their putters so this is this is part of a broader effort to today they would say unify the lineup right where we're not going to do this thing anymore where you have a whole bunch of products in japan that you can't get in the u.s and you've got a whole bunch of u.s products you got that you can't get in, in europe and european products you can't get anywhere else they're like it doesn't really make sense if a, if a guy for example wins on on a japanese tour with a driver we can't really promote that because it's not available and and everything that goes with that and so mizuno has said yeah let's just flatline this thing and for the most part make the same products available worldwide in a consistent lineup which is i mean kind of obvious thing to do more than anything i else. mean they 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 got drop shipped um to our facility and i picked them up and i was a little bit shocked why because they're blue well not that but i hit them and i was like oh that feels like a forged iron and then come to come to read Guess what? They have the 1025 carbon steel that they use in their irons in that putter. Yeah, we've got some of the older Mizuno versions from the European ones and the Japanese ones. And, you know, 
no one ever saw them except the people that come into our facility. But I love them. You know, they feel incredible. They were phenomenal. But I was surprised at how much positive reaction there was to Mizuno putters being released on our site. I mean, I knew people like Mizuno, but I mean, our readers love Mizuno for sure. Yeah, but I mean, I didn't think that the putters would be even a blip to people, but people really were interested. They feel really good, um, and the three models that uh, were at the studio. Um, I mean, Miranda, you can you can read off the three models. All I have is that they have three models. I yep, was there you go. To you got it. On that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's three conventional shapes, right? So they didn't yeah. go nuts. They took kind of blade, and I think there might be one kind of it's like a half moon kind of what M Craft yeah, so one, M Craft two. Like if you're if you're just sort of coming back to the market, you you, you don't come in with something that looks like. You know what a whatever Mizuno's take on a spider would look like. We're like like Adam crazy like Adam's putters. Like, yeah, with like a, a rudder hanging off the backside <laughs> or something like that, right? It's look there are there are models that sell, right? The answer, the answer shape you can bank yep. on. There's money in that and that half moon shape. And so that that was pretty much the approach. It's like let let's stick to to popular shapes. And again, there's a cost in that, right? Let's let's not spend a whole bunch of money making stuff that people aren't going to buy. If so. you ever want to get in the putter business. Just make your own answer and put your button and put your last yeah, name true. on it. Everyone does it. Right. But yeah. I mean, they have the, the three putters they have is for different types of strokes. And every time everyone comes in and say, what part do you think? I said, you need to go get fit first off. And the iPing app, just identify what stroke type you have first and then go from there. Because I mean, Mizuno has the strong arc, the, the mid arc, and then the face balance for those straight back, straight through golfers. But even though they have three different ones, they all feel great. You love them. I do. I can tell. And <laughs> Look at his eyes I mean, light up. Like, <laughs> they are. They're really good. This is the happiest I've ever seen Harry about a product. Like, look at him. He's like, I love a good feeling. You love uh, a good peach. Club. I love a good peach. Um, and as Mizuno as soon as off the face, I, I picked up a putter today that came in and I was not impressed at all. I won't say the name. Um, but I was, just, hey. I was laughing because compared to the Mizuno, I mean, it's one of, it just lives up to the rotation of soft feel going back to Mizuno. It's just, I don't know if they have any uh, face tech in the putters. I didn't quite get that far into the article, but no, I don't think people <laughs> care because they're Scotty Cameron sales, right? But they don't have any face tech apart from, uh, like the- I said, I was shocked at how many people commented, liked, and really were pleased yeah. with a an answer. That's blue that has a Mizuno stamp on it. I mean, that's basically what it is, but like yeah. you say, it really feels good. All right, so another new release from this week, the Odyssey Triple Track Putter. What do we got on that one? It's interesting, you know. Um, they have a ball that has three lines on it that came out. This is actually really smart from a marketing yeah, standpoint. Smart. So if you buy this putter, you're going to feel like you're going to have to da- play this damn ball now, I would guess. But So golfers for years put lines on their balls when they putted. Uh, we actually did a test with line, no line. And believe it or not, there was not... Didn't find much... Didn't find much. Actually, it hurt you from the farther you were away because if you put the line where you thought it was... It's, it's a but, big gap. Well, you get farther and farther, yeah. it's harder to line that line up, right? So then people were aiming farther and farther away from the hole. But with this, I think, you know, we haven't done a test on it yet, but it's got three lines on the ball, but then three lines that extend to the putter. And Ping did do a test years ago that found that there was a length of lines, and I think there were three of them on that original catch that actually improve people's face uh, consistency path. Um, So if you combine the ball and the putter, when you combine those two, you have a long track to be able, almost like a pool cue, you know, like being behind a pool stick. And you do seem from a, uh, you know, perceptual, you know, without doing the test so far right now, it does look like there might be some some benefit to it from a visual standpoint. when I, me and Tony were on the uh, conf- same conference call with Callaway, and they were telling us, "Oh, the triple track and, game changer." And, and just looking at the stats that they picked up, though, I was like blown, blown away by the dispersion. And because I think I struggle with alignment first off, and then I come Most in across, and I, I miss everything left. So I think this ball and the triple track putter is going to be benefiting more golfers out there that well let's say it does or doesn't right so we are kind of the ones that are going to do the biggest test to see if it probably works but let's say a golfer thinks it does in his mind he thinks it works just like you hey i've got a trouble i've got problems lining up putts this makes me feel like i'm lining up putts better 
guess what you're also going to do now? You're going to go buy that ball. Or you, you'll paint three lines on a yeah, Tyler store. Which, look, there's always going to be products out there that allow people to do it, but they're going to sell more of those three straight balls because oh of those God, putters, yeah. and they're going to sell more putters because of those three straight balls. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's, it's worth pointing out, too, that it's not it's a little more complicated. Not a lot more complicated, really, but Come on, a little bit, more, little bit more complicated than 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 a Sharpie lines. and some tape. Well, no, so it's... So there's just two things, right? First of all, they actually license this technology, so nobody else is going to be able to replicate it exactly. But it, it's based on a science called vernier acuity. And without getting into the muck of, of how it works, because honestly, I'd have to go reread the damn article anyway. But um, the, the keys thing are you, the lines need to be well contrasted. So that's why they have the red and the blue, right? You can't just, if it was, for example, three red lines wouldn't work as well. So you have to have contrasting colors, uh, so that's part of the equation. And then the other thing is the, the middle line, the relationship of the thickness from the middle line has to be different from the ones on the edges as well. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to vary your colors and your line thicknesses if you're going to mark your ball like this. And again, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to come up with a tool, but it does look like a Walmart, it does look like a Walmart putter. putter. I mean, it's not just that they haven't just put the three lines on it. They've, they've actually changed the face, um, the they've shaved it's like a shaved face tony pretty much and it's a it just cleaned up the insert yeah exactly so it's it's not just the putter that they've had last time and stuck three lines on it they've changed the fundamentals of the of the putter as well i think i'm looking forward to seeing how it tests me too for sure um, if it can help golfers what was the claim adam it was 106 percent. there's a lot of claims on it but the okay. biggest most staggering one from a numbers perspective, it says it's a hundred percent more consistent from your keeping your face square at impact. Correct, Tony? You, I, you'd have to go. Well, there were so many charts. Even I've kind of lost track. <laughs> if I'm yeah, being brutally so honest, but yeah, hundred. Yeah, so the the stat was a hundred and six percent more consistent, basically face face impact. Okay. And there's, I mean, the the bottom line is they've they shared on on this release between. Between the triple track technology and the and the stroke lab uh, shafts that, that are part of the offering, they have shared way more data than you would typically see in a release. So, you know whether whether it pans out to be real and the same rules apply, right? Better, worse, or the same. Uh, this appears to be something that that Callaway and Odyssey legitimately believe uh, could have a, a huge benefit for golfers. Well, they wouldn't release all that data if they didn't say it didn't uh, work. I've seen plenty of bullshit data before. Oh, you yeah, seen? No, that's a, yeah. <laughs> well. Four out of five dentists. Right? I have <laughs> never seen them publish data that ever said we got worse. Put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's. Which we all know that some of them have gotten worse. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a little tease for next week. There is a pitching wedge that is 38 degrees that is going to be released. Yeah. We can't say the name, but that is, that's real. A 38 degree pitching wedge from a major OEM is going to be hitting uh, the front page of my gospel next week. Right, Tony? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> So you and I had a conversation before the show started and we kind of laughed, right? But there's actually a cool story behind this. Um, I, I'd say that we find out about things probably a little bit earlier than other people. So we, we saw the loft jacking trend, you know, years ago and got pissed off like everybody else did because a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it though initially was based on giving golfers more distance in a launch monitor setting, which we all know sells golf clubs, but the reality is there's some cool things, right? So yes, this is loft jack to the extreme. So the first question I asked you was, what is the bottom? Like what is going to be the lowest lofted pitching wedge that comes out in the next 10 years? Where's the bottom? I kind of ran some numbers and made some reasonably educated guesses. And, and I think 35, 36 degrees somewhere in there is the, the feasible limit. That's that's where I'm going to say. And and I think it'll be, I don't know that we'll actually get there, but that is like, if you kind of redefined a few things and, and sort of changed your set makeup and did some things like that, that I think is, is the absolute limit. And, you know, hopefully we, we don't get quite to that point, but. So you're looking at a tine or a nine, nine, depending on what, what brand you play. Well, yeah. For older irons, right? Yeah. But like Tony and I were talking today, if you eliminated the 60 degree wedge, so right, you got the top of the bag and the bottom of the bag. So let's say you got a 10 degree driver and a 60 degree wedge. The majority of amateur golfers should get rid of the 60 degree wedge, which brings the bottom of their bag up to a 54, 56, whatever. So then the gaps become different and that 38 doesn't anymore look like a 38, right? Yeah. Um, so 
there's some other things that are interesting too about it that uh, we were discussing. Well, that- yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with a 38 degree pitch wedge, but they have to have the same launch conditions as the normal pitch and wedge um, loft. Because at the end of the day, if you can't hold a green, what's the point of having it in your bag? So is this going to be the same launch conditions or is it going to be um, a jack loft that we've seen in most products these days? T- to be seen for sure. But I mean, I think... Was it was it last year, right at the PGA show? Uh, Titleist had the the concept iron on display. Yeah. And you look at the you look at the, that loft number, and you're like you're like, come on, guys, this this bullshit is never gonna work. You know, nobody's gonna get this off the ground. And then you take a swing with it, and it's arguably the highest launching seven iron I've ever hit. And you're like, okay, all right, so so this is this is actually playable. You could you could be successful on the golf course with this and you're going to get you're going to get more distance and you're still going to get that stopping power so here's the reality right it started with distance and selling clubs but where it's at right now i can tell you what it's not going back we're not going back to 45 48 degree pitching wedges it ain't happening like this is yeah this is the norm this is going to be the new norm so you can complain about it all you want but the technology and everything and how they're evolving things the loss are getting stronger but launch angle descent angle is working towards like you said the concept is one of the highest launching irons you can hit. Right, so, so here's here's another thing you should think of is dispersion. So normally, if it's if it's a lower lofted club, it's harder con- to control your dispersion. So, but it's high- generally a longer length club too. A- correct. So but that's th- is that's this related to tighter? dynamic loft. So it's it's it it shouldn't get significantly worse because again, all those equations are are based on. On, on axis tilt, which is derived from what TrackMan calls spin loft. We're getting deep in the weeds here, but it's basically the relationship between dynamic loft and your attack angle. So as long as the, the internal weighting of that club is delivering what I guess you would describe as an adequate or proper amount of dynamic loft, then then your dispersion equation doesn't change significantly. So, All right, it, for the, all those shouldn't. golfers out there that don't know what dynamic loft, Tony, what is dynamic loft? It's it's the actual amount of loft delivered to the golf ball at impact. So, invariably, when you sling, swing a club, the as you're leading into impact, the the head kind of rushes ahead of the shaft, the toe dips down, and the loft, the face kind of kicks up, and that is all kind of driven by in part the shaft and then the weighting and the geometry of the club, as well as how a given individual delivers that club. And so, yeah, you're gonna get that loft added at impact, right? It's it's the reason why your nine degree driver, for example, launches at more than nine degrees, right? That's it's the delivered loft is gonna be higher, and that's that that club head kind of kicking forward. So it's launching at say ten degrees, my nine degree driver. But then your dynamic loft punches it up to, you know, fourteen or fifteen. Exactly. That's that's that. It's some of it's a shaft, some of it's a head. And so if if companies are successful in doing what they're saying they they do, right? Which is we drove a lot of mass, we put a lot of heavy stuff in the bottom and the back of this club head, so we get more dynamic loft. Then it can work. It's it's when those designs kind of fail at that dy- uh, generation of dynamic loft that, that things get kind of nasty. But yeah, it's you're not. I said this on Twitter today. Looking at looking at a spec sheet doesn't really tell you anything about how that club is going to perform. Right. It's static loft is a number and it's become meaningless. And the other point I would make as we're wrapping up this this loft jacking dis- discussion is. Like nobody, nobody assumes that there's one loft that's right for everybody in a driver, right? I, I've played as low as as an eight degree driver, even tuned down to seven five, right? And there are guys that play 12, 13 degree drivers, and there's nobody who's screaming that, you know, you loft jacked a driver. You're you're just playing a seven point five to get more distance. No, it's like <laughs> it's about creating the the optimal conditions it's a relationship with all the parts right I mean, right it's about creating the ball flight that is right for me right it's it's using loft to get in a window and it's that's, always like i say it's the paper, paper airplane analogy right like you've got to get that launch condition with your paper airplane to be right so that yours lands at the or goes off at the angle you want and descends at the angle you want and goes farther than the the other one that shoots straight up in the air or dives down you know Right. And that, you know, I mean, that's, it's kind of an odd example, but that's going to vary too, right? Like the ideal, the, the paper airplane that's going to create that condition is going to be different for you based on the speed that you're moving and, yep. and where you release that airplane than it is for me, right? Who's not going to 
do exactly the same thing you do. So loft is a fitting variable period. Doesn't matter what the club is, whether it's a driver, a wedge or something in between. Which is a great point. It's just a variable. It's a great point because there's so many what they call vanity lofts, right? Like when I was on the other side of the business, no guy would come in and ever, ever buy a 10 or sorry, a 12 to a 14 degree driver. Didn't happen. And it really doesn't matter. It's just whatever gives you the right launch conditions is all you should care about, you know? Absolutely. Period. Hard stop, as they say. Yep. All right. So that about covers releases for this week, right? We've talked enough about that. Yes. We could go on and on, but uh, like, uh, like a hundred more. Okay. Well, on a different note, Harry and I actually this morning got back from Baltimore where we went to go chat with Jordan Spieth about the launch of the Spieth Force, which I know you'll be testing in soft goods coming up. Yep. Yep. Um, so we went up there just, they had a big summit and long story short is there was a lot of fitness, but it was their first summit and the philosophy was uh, was quite intriguing to learn. It was an interesting idea for like a, a summit. They got a lot of um, social media influencers together, personal trainers and that sort of thing. So it wasn't really golf centric, but as a piggyback on it, Jordan Spieth was there to explain the dynamics behind developing a shoe and what goes into it. And he told us really like the onset of it was he wanted a competitive advantage. So we went to Under Armour and said, hey, we've got to get me a shoe that, you know, it has the specifications for my foot specifics. And it's developed from there to something that they're marketing to the general public. Um, yeah. And the two tests that I've performed since I've been on my golf spy, I have seen, um, a, an improvement in stability and traction from year to year now when it comes to this new one they say it's i i believe that this traction and stability is pretty much there well now when it comes to this year they have to improve in somewhere else um so we'll look we'll put it to the test in, in the next couple of weeks and and see how it performs it was nice looking i can tell you that much it was good, looked looking. good. we've seen some evolution right like if we go back to the you know, several years ago, the Under Armour shoes did not perform well at all. And, you know, there was a lot of issues with, with not just the performance aspect, but the fact that, you know, a lot of guys said they weren't comfortable, right? Yeah, it's so, tight and it was, it was uncomfortable when walking. But last year, they've made a huge improvement. Um, and they said they've improved on that this year. So I'm looking forward to putting it to the test again. And at, at the end of the day, if they, if they back the data, then perfect. Yep. Hooray golf shoes. All right, so that about wraps it up for us today. Next week, we're actually going to be broadcasting from Orlando because we're going down for the PGA show, which I know is everyone's favorite week of the year, right, Tony? Well, Tony loves it. Son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I enjoy it. It'll be it's... my first year, so I'm excited. Yeah, well, good for you. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> what is this, Harry? Yeah. This will be what? Year, year three for you, year. right? Yeah, and yeah, I, think... I, I still I still look forward to it. I just My legs are going to scream at me for Two the more years. Two more years and you'll be over it. No, yeah. it's uh, it's a good week if for no other reason than I, I guess it's a break from writing all these release stories, which will be yeah. nice. But it's it's always good to get to go down, see people, get caught up with guys that you you know only see once a year at the PGA show or or maybe one other time. So for me, it's just, it's just about walking around, getting to getting to see people I haven't seen in a while, and and hopefully stumbling upon something really cool. Uh, a couple of things look promising this year, right? The, there's a new Mevo coming. So we'll definitely want to check Mevo, that yeah. out. Um, yeah. Mevo uh, I plus. Don't know what they call it? I think it's, it's yeah, Mevo, Mevo plus. plus. I'm, I'm guessing it'll be a heavier or a heftier price tag, but still kind of some cool tech to look at. And and like I said, just kind of chill out, see some people, and and do some fun stuff after the show winds down each night. So there you have it. No putts given live from the PGA show. Something to look forward to next week, although not technically live. <laughs> as li as close to live be, as we can get, right? That would be a debacle. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you guys for having me. How'd I do? Can I stay? I don't know. Yeah, we have to I speak about it. I think you did all right. We'll okay. speak about it. But, cool. All right. But well. you got you to you you say we out. That's how we end it. That's how we end it? Yeah. Is but this a got, joke? Like, Is this like rookie no, hazing? No, no. You just got to do it in deep voice. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's it for today. No putts given. We out. <laughs>